Hey, so we're all here to talk about diabetes today. Um, you have in front of you some information. Uh, you have learning objectives on the first page. Uh, you have a copy of the slides uh, that you can take notes next to. Does everyone have a pen to make notes? And then you also have a test at the end. So this is a post-test uh, situation. And um, feel free to stop and ask questions while we're on um, while we're doing this. So at a nurse and a family, you know, we we're very concerned about a variety of speci uh, special disease processes. And I've developed um, some specialty programs, as you can see here, for um, a variety of disease processes. Today we're talking about diabetes. That's our sweetheart program. We also have a program that uh, addresses specifically congestive heart failure. That's our fresh air program. Fall prevention, our safe home program, freedom of motion program, our arthritis program, memory plus program, that's dementia, hospice support. And as an emergency physician, my attitude on hospice support is aggressive comfort care. And I'm currently uh, writing a program for post-acute geriatric psychiatric support in the home. And um, so this is one of the things that further distinguishes us from all the other companies that are out there. A nurse and a family has medical oversight with specialized services. So let's talk about diabetes. So there's two main types of diabetes. We're going to talk a little bit about diabetes insipidus initially, then we're going to forget about it because you're never going to see it. It's very rare. Diabetes mellitus is quite common. That's what we're going to be worried about mostly with our clients today. And diabetes is a Greek word. It means passing through. And so the common denominator in diabetes insipidus or diabetes mellitus is lots and lots of urine production. So lots of peeing. That's called polyuria. Um, because you're peeing a lot, you get dehydrated, so you drink a lot, and that's called polydipsia. So polydipsia, polyuria, the two main symptoms of diabetes, any type of diabetes. But diabetes insipidus has to do with the brain and the kidney. Um, the pituitary gland makes a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. So if you put it diuretic, like Lasix, it makes you pee a lot. Antidiuretic means you're not peeing a lot. Antidiuretic hormone. And uh, the other name for that is arginine vasopressin. So the two types of diabetes insipidus are when you don't make antidiuretic hormone or when it gets to the kidneys, the kidneys don't really know that it's there. And this is a nice little graph that kind of shows the, the pathway. So the pituitary gland sits kind of between um, my fingers right now, uh, between the optic chiasm, and it produces a variety of hormones, including antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. And um, so we would see, when in residency in the trauma service, people that had head injuries, we'd see uh, people with diabetes insipidus because their pituitary gland was shutting down, wasn't making vasopressin anymore. But the other type is when the vasopressin gets to the kidneys, the kidneys don't recognize it. It's actually a similar mechanism to type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and that has to do with insulin production. If you're, making, you're not making insulin, like pituitary glands not making vasopressin, or your cells don't recognize the insulin and don't use it, just like the kidney's not recognizing um, vasopressin and not using it. There you go, diabetes insipidus, don't worry about it, you're never gonna see it again. But you'll, you, it's always kind of interesting when you ask people about their diseases and they comment specifically, I have sugar diabetes. And so they understand there's more than one type of diabetes. There's sugar diabetes, it's diabetes mellitus. 10% of the population has diabetes. Um, that's 26 million Americans, it's extremely common. Type 1 diabetes is when you don't make insulin. Type 2 diabetes is when your cells don't see the insulin that you're making. And then there's a the third type, gestational diabetes, which we'll talk about very briefly because it's not really going to be our patient population that you're going to see that in. So once again, the two main symptoms of diabetes are polydipsia and polyuria. We're going to be transported back in time to the years 1850. You're physicians. You have a patient that's come to you complaining of being thirsty all the time, urinating all the time, and you suspect they have diabetes, but you don't know for sure, so you have to test them. And so you've asked them for a sample of urine, and this is the sample of urine. And it's noticed in 1850, and you're marveling at the magic of plastic, <laughs> which didn't exist in 1850, but there's your urine sample right there, and you're going to make a diagnosis now. Taste the urine sample, and tell me if it tastes sweet. Very sweet. You just diagnosed diabetes. That's how we used to do this 100 years ago. We don't do it like that anymore, thank goodness. Um, and this is what happens uh, and why the urine is sweet. So this is the business end of the kidneys called the glomerular apparatus. And this is Bowman's capsule here. And this is where urine is made. So this is blood going in, blood going out, and then urine being created here. 
And what this is, is a sieve. It's got holes in it. Things fall through this. Just like when you make spaghetti, you put spaghetti in the sieve and drain out the water. Well, the holes in this are just big enough to let sugar fall through. So sugar falls out of the bloodstream into the urine, and sugar likes to be hydrated. It likes to be wet. And when you have a concentration of sugar, it'll pull water from the bloodstream into the urine to, to hydrate the sugar. That causes the excess urine formation. All right? And so um, that's why you're peeing a lot, and your pee tastes sweet. So that's the, that's the mechanism with that. So the common denominator in all types of diabetes is you have extra sugar in the bloodstream. If you tasted the blood, it would taste sweet as well. Um, but the cells are starving. So sugar is like gasoline to a car. The cells use it to burn for cellular mechanism. Right? If it doesn't have sugar available, it's going to do something else. It's going to burn in a different way, but it's actually starving to death. It's just like being um, in the ocean in a lifeboat and you're thirsty and you're surrounded by water, but you can't use any of it. Same thing here. The cells are swimming in sugar, but they can't get it inside them. Um, and the pancreas is the organ that makes insulin. And insulin is the key to how diabetes works. Um, the pancreas has two main functions. One is a digestive function, and the other is an endocrine function where it makes certain hormones. The digestive function, uh, through a digestive function, it makes something called pancreatic juice, which is this witch's brew of enzymes that help digest things like proteins and stuff like that. And then it creates also insulin and glucagon and somatostatin. We're not going to talk about somatostatin today. Insulin causes the cells to absorb sugar in the bloodstream. Somatostatin, or uh, the glucagon, goes to the liver and tells the liver, release your sugar stores. So if you, come, if you have low blood sugar, the pancreas will release glucagon and tell the liver to convert glycogen into glucose and now you can use it to burn. And if someone comes into the ER with low blood sugar, I can give them a shot of glucagon, which we do, and it pops their blood sugar back up. So we can't get an IV to give them sugar water in their vein, then we can give them glucagon, which will cause their liver to release sugar stores and reverse that uh, hypoglycemia, or show low sugar level. But this is the pancreas. It sits kind of, here's my liver right here, and pancreas kind of sits right in there like that, nestled in there. And you can see, uh, here's the gallbladder kind of peeking below the liver. And one of the things the liver does is creates bile, and bile is stored in the gallbladder. And bile, who knows what bile does? Anybody know what bile does? You know what bile does? I don't. You know what bile does? You know what bile does? It makes um, digestion easier. Of what? Digestion of what? Cool. Fat, yeah, fat. Fat, exactly right. Bile is like soap. And so if you ever have greasy dishes and you try to wash them without soap, they stay greasy, right? So you put a little soap in there, it emulsifies the fat, causes the break of the little tiny drops that you can then lift off the plate. The same thing happens with, with your Big Mac in your duodenum. Um, you have a fat signal that goes to the, to the, to the, to the gallbladder, squeezes bile into the, into the digestive system, and it emulsifies the fat in your Big Mac so you can absorb it into your bloodstream. And this is the common bile duct, the pancreatic, I mean, this is the bile duct, the pancreatic duct, the common bile duct. And so pancreatic juice is being made here and dropping into the duodenum too to help uh, digest things like proteins. Um, and this is an image you should burn into your brain. This is what happens with diabetes. This is the mechanism. So this is outside the cell. This is inside the cell. This is the cell membrane. And this is a glucose channel that allows glucose to drop from the bloodstream into the cell where it can be burned. And this is insulin. It's sitting in a little insulin receptor. It's like uh, any of you have um, uh, a car with a gas cap that requires a key. That's what insulin is, the key to open the gas cap up. So you can put the nozzle in and fill the tank with gas so your car can burn the gas, the same thing. This is the key that opens the gas, the, the, uh, the, the um, the, uh, what's it called on the gas, on the, the car? Gas cap. Gas cap. That opens the gas cap that allows glucose to fall into the cell. So in, pan in diabetes mellitus type 1, where you're not making insulin in the first place because your pancreas isn't functioning, there's no key. These aren't opening. And so glucose can't get in. And so what you do with diabetes mellitus type 1 or juvenile onset diabetes is you provide insulin. Right? Simple. Simple fix. Um, and it allows glucose to fall through, and now you can burn the glucose. All right, so that's diabetes mellitus type 1. You're not making enough insulin or any insulin at all, 
And so you need to have somebody give you insulin, and it's usually a shot. Diabetes mellitus type 2 is different. It has to do with um, your body has been um, bombarded by too much sugar for too long, and finally the little insulin receptor, the little key, doesn't recognize the insulin anymore. So it's like the, the, the story of the boy who cried wolf. Who knows that story? Tell me that story. Um, so there was a little boy who cried wolf, and all of the villagers came to get the wolf, but there was no wolf. And he did this a number of times, till finally the villagers didn't come when there really was a wolf. And in the real version, he gets eaten. Right, exactly. The boy gets eaten. <laughs> because the villagers don't believe him anymore. Same thing here. So diabetes mellitus type 2... You, the, the cells don't believe you anymore because you've, been, you've, been, you've had so much sugar in your bloodstream so often and the insulin has been you know, uh, uh, elaborated by the pancreas into the, into, the, into the bloodstream so many times that finally it just doesn't even see the insulin anymore. You're just crying wolf of not opening up to get the glucose shadow. And there's one main cause of diabetes mellitus type 2. Who knows what that is? Obesity. That's it. Obesity. So we didn't evolve to eat like this. The, the way we started eating like this during the agricultural revolution, and now it's gotten worse with processed foods and stuff like that. We evolved for the vast majority of the time. This species has been on this planet to like stumble across some wild lettuce and gorge on that, and then starve for a couple days, and then hit a rabbit over the head with a rock and eat that, and then starve for a couple days, and then maybe see a fruit tree that's that's got fruit on it in fall, and gorging on it. And because your body knows that you're never going to see a fruit tree again, and I better put fat on to store that, um, that's, why, that's our response to that. But we're eating fruit trees every day now, three, three meals a day. And so that's what's causing excess blood sugar, causing excess insulin production, causing the, the, the little glucose receptor in the cell to not recognize the insulin anymore. It shuts it all off. That's because of our, our modern lifestyle. And gestational diabetes is the type of diabetes that happens when you're pregnant. It's generally people that are about to get type 2 diabetes or kind of on, the, on the, the cusp of that already. And then being pregnant kind of knocks them over the edge to become diabetic. They deliver the child, often that reverses, but then a couple years later they develop diabetes type 2. All right, now this is why we're talking about this. We're talking about our sweetheart program and a lot of our clients, remember 10% of the population has diabetes, a lot of our clients have diabetes. So we need to be aware of the disease processes associated with diabetes so that we can help our clients avoid really bad outcomes because diabetes is a really bad disease. So diabetics are much more prone to have heart attacks, strokes, amputations, um, nerves that are dead, going blind, loss of kidneys. And then this last one is diabetic ketoacidosis. It's an emergency, uh, and so it's one of the only ones that hear that well, there are several of these are emergencies, but this is uh, an emergency medicine kind of thing, which I just want to talk about because I'm an emergency doctor. So coronary artery disease, heart attacks. This is the lesion right here. You've got an artery that has cholesterol placking in it. It's all cr it's crummy. It's not a nice, smooth wall of the artery anymore. <clears throat> and if you think about... And the reason, you know, so this inside of the arteries, it's called endothelial cells. And if you bathe endothelial cells and sugar too long, this is what happens. So, so this is kind of the common denominator for a lot of these disease processes we're going to talk about. The arteries end up looking like that. Um, and so if you think about how fluid flows in channels, imagine in your mind a serene river with straight banks and the water's just flowing nice and straight all the way down the bank. It's called laminar flow. Now you throw a rock on the side and all of a sudden you're going to have eddy currents and turbulent flow and stuff like that. The same thing happens here in this guy's heart. Every time his heart pumps, then the blood is going through here and there's eddy currents that are created and turbulent flow. And what that can do is activate platelets and platelets form clots. And what a platelet likes more than anything else is to party. And so if you turn on a platelet, all the other platelets around it are going to want to party. So they're going to grab onto it and form a clot. And so imagine inside this artery, this doesn't help if I reach this way, does it? Imagine inside this artery, um, a, little, a little platelet gets activated there, and now a little clot's forming. Every time the heart beats and blood goes through there, the, the little clot is going And eventually it goes breaks off. And as that artery goes further and further away from its origin, it branches and gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and finally goes to capillary beds. At some point, that clot is going to exceed the diameter of that artery. It's going Stop it up like a cork in a bottle. That's a heart attack. It's also a stroke. And so that part of the, of the heart 
behind that clot doesn't have any blood, doesn't have any oxygen, oxygen, and it dies. That's a heart attack. That's what it's about. And so our clients are much higher risk. Our clients with diabetes are at much higher risk of having heart attacks. So you need to be aware of the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Classic signs and symptoms, crushing chest pain, elephant sitting on my chest, radiating down my left arm, into my left neck, into my left jaw. I'm sweaty, I'm nauseated, I'm short of breath. Classic signs. Diabetics can have those signs or have nothing at all, silent heart attack. So you need to be aware when you're on shift with your diabetic patients of all of these signs and then, and then pain is, uh, the Latin word for pain is angina, pain in the chest is angina pectoris, and so angina um, happens when you're not getting enough, uh, enough uh, uh, oxygen to your heart, and so um, you can have something called anginal equivalence. So yeah, chest pain, sweaty, nauseated, short of breath, that's angina, or heart attack. Or maybe you just have a little short of breath and you're sweaty. Or maybe your hand aches a little bit. So you have to be a detective when you're on duty with our clients. Okay, you have diabetes, and I just saw you walk across the room and now you're really short of breath and your left arm hurts. You're not having chest pain. You're not sweaty. Maybe you're having a heart attack. That's the thinking you have to have. And that means you need to call me. Pick up the phone and call me. And we'll talk about it. And we'll discuss whether or not should I call 911 or not. And there's a time sensitive issue here because if that person has a heart attack and you get them to be in the ER soon enough, I can send them to my buddy, the cardiologist, in the catheterization laboratory, and you can open that artery up and save that heart muscle, right? Or I can give them a clot busting medicine, dissolve the clot, open it up, save that heart muscle. But if you wait too long, the heart muscle's dead, and now they have a lot of problems associated with that. So you need to have a low index of suspicion, uh, and you need to be able to call me, know to call me and run these things by me, all right? I'm not going to be upset with you for a 3 a.m. call about something like this. That's what I'm here for. Um, so you can have any one of these symptoms, any combination of these symptoms, no symptoms at all, right? The most common cause of heart attacks in the United States is diabetes mellitus. Stroke. This is that artery. Remember that picture before the artery with the cholesterol plaque in it? That's what this looks like right here. Little clot forms on that. Boom, sticks here, kills the brain. This is much more time sensitive than the heart attack, right? Um, I can give a clot busting medicine for this only within three hours of the onset of symptoms. And you, there's no such thing as a silent stroke, right? Stroke symptoms in a diabetic is just, are just like stroke symptoms in anyone else. All of a sudden, you can't move one side of your body, your facial droop, you're dizzy, bad headache, something like that. So it's not like you have to be a detective. You're like, well, something's wrong, right? Call me after you call 911. Because they have to get in front of the doctor soon enough for a variety of tests to have been ordered and come back and still be within three hours where they can't get this medicine, okay? Um, so, and, and a lot of your clients will be like, no, 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 I'm just tired, I'm just tired, I'll do a rest for a while, a while. Don't listen to them. You're the medical adult in the house. You call 911, okay? Um, so, the symptoms of a, of a stroke, right there. Uh, Heather, what's the most common cause of stroke in the United States? Diabetes. Diabetes, Diabetes. right. Peripheral vascular disease. So this is, remember this artery from the heart picture? Same damn thing here. So this is not letting blood through very well. Some's getting through, which means this extremity is not getting quite as much blood. What's one of the main functions of blood? What does it do? Carries oxygen. oxygen. Right. Carries oxygen. So the oxygen tension down here in the foot isn't very good. Um, couple that with peripheral neuropathy, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. It's a setup for bad wounds to form on diabetics' feet in particular that have a hard time healing. And so let me give you an example. You need oxygen to heal wounds. So Heather, what's the percent of oxygen in the atmosphere at sea level? Um, I think it's, I don't know, 40%? 21%. Twenty-one. Almost all the rest is nitrogen. So we're at 7,000 feet. What's the percent of oxygen here? It's not half, it's like 40, 30% of that? 21%. Dang it. What's the percent of oxygen on the top of Mount Everest? 20%. Good job. Okay. So, but the thing is, there's much less air pressure up there, right? And so there's fewer oxygen molecules per unit of air. And, but you need that oxygen in order to heal wounds. And I'll give you an example. I grew up in Alaska, I used to be a high altitude mountaineer, and I was on Mount McKinley once at about 16,000 feet on a rope team when I fell in a crevasse. And the rope caught me, that was fine, but I punctured my calf with my crampon. 
right? And we like, climbed out of the crass, and I was fine. The next day, pus is draining out of this hole. And I'm a medical student, so I've got like, you know, sterile Q-tips. I'm cleaning my pussy hole out with this Q-tip. And then the next day, it's pussing again. Next day, pussing again. Next day, two weeks up there at 16,000 feet and higher, pussed out every day, right? And Mount McKinley, interestingly, is the tallest mountain in the world from base to summit. It's uh, 20,320 feet, but the base is at 300 feet. And Mount Everest is taller than that, 29,000 something, but it starts at 18,000 feet. So, and you fly in, when you climb up in Kinley, you go from a little town called Talkeetan, Alaska, you take a bush plane in, you land on the Kehiltonic Glacier at 7,000 feet, which is where we are now, and then you climb the mountain. Um, so, two weeks up there at 21% oxygen, but very low oxygen density, but at very low pressure, atmospheric pressure, and I fly out to Talkeetan and the next day the wounds heal, because I have oxygen. So, uh, that's important for these guys because there are a variety of interventions you can do to help get oxygen into that foot like hyperbaric chambers and things like that if you need to. Um, now you can also have, this is, this is a, a foot that's having trouble getting enough oxygen because the blood flow is diminished, but this can also clot off acutely and turn the foot blue and cold. Okay, so um, when you're looking at you know, evaluating the, the, um, the extremities of your diabetics, if they suddenly, if it's cold or it's in pain or it's pale or you can't feel a pulse anymore, those are the three P's, pulselessness, pallor, pain, and poikilothermia, which means cold. Uh, so the four P's, rather. Um, those are signs that you have an acutely ischemic limb. That's called 911. And uh, a surgeon can come in and bypass this with an arterial graft and reperfuse that foot and save it. Otherwise, they're looking at an amputation. What's the most common cause of amputation in the United States? Diabetes. Good job. Okay, so cool or cold extremity, decreased pulses, or cyanotic mean blue. means blue. All right, peripheral neuropathy. This is when diabetics, like I use my mom as an example. She's been a long time diabetic. Her feet are numb. She can't feel anything in her feet. Also, so Heather, if I threw you up on this table right now and took your shoe and sock off and grabbed your toe, big toe, told you to close your eyes and move your toe up, I asked you which direction it went, you'd say, yeah, that's called proprioception. So your proprioception is intact. My mom can't tell which way you're moving her toe because... Her nerves are dead because of diabetes. And you can see kind of the progression. This is kind of a nerve um, that is dying because the arterial supply is not working because of those lesions inside the artery that you saw in the illustration of the heart. Right? Same thing here. So those nerves are dying. There's two different kinds of uh, neuropathy. One is where you don't feel anything. It's numb. The other is where you have this horrible burning pain, which is a, another kind. Um, is there one that's more common? Yeah, no. No? So decreased sensation, decreased proprioception, and pain, peripheral neuropathy. Now combine that, think about your diabetic patients. We're going to see a picture of a diabetic ulcer. We have one client that uh, is diabetic. He went on a trip with his wife. He has peripheral neuropathy. He has peripheral vascular disease, so not very good oxygen tension. Can't feel anything down there. Didn't notice when he stepped on the nail until his wife noticed the odor oh, on his goodness. foot. And the pus was draining out of his red, swollen foot. The infection was already in the bone, so by the time you get to the hospital, it's time for an amputation. Right? This is where you come in. You, one of the things we're going to do for our clients is a variety of things. We'll talk about each of them. Is inspect their feet every day that you're there. You can nice, gentle washing of their feet. You can kind of get it between your toes and check for any holes, check for any ulcers. And never, 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 never clip the toenails of your diabetic patients because you might accidentally clip the toe. My mom had a podiatrist, and podiatrists are full-on physicians that do nothing but feet, and so they're highly trained people. Podiatrists come to her home to clip her toenails and clip her toe. There was an ulcer that formed that took months to get rid of because of that. So even a highly trained person can make that mistake. You will never clip the toenails of our clients, okay? Of our diabetic clients in particular. Okay, retinopathy. What's the most common cause of blindness in the United States? Diabetes. Good job. So this is an illustration of the, of the eye. So the eyeball, cornea, this blue stuff is the iris. Here's the hole in the iris called the pupil. Here's the lens, and here's the retina. So what happens is, an like here's a hand, and, and light is bouncing off the hand. Photons are going in here. The lens is refracting that and projecting it onto the back of the, of the um, eye, onto the retina. So this, illustrate, this hand right here is coming up like this, upside down on the retina. Over time, your brain turns it around and it comes right side up again. But we're actually perceiving the image upside down in our eye. And this retina is composed of 
nerve cells called rods and cones, and that's how you see things, right? But if your retina is dying, then you don't see anything at all. This is an example of, di of diabetic retinopathy. So here you have some hemorrhages taking place. Here, hemorrhage took place last year, and now it's a scar tissue. And this is healthy tissue. So you can see with this, can you see with that? No, right, so one of the things we do for our diabetic clients in the Sweetheart Program is encourage them to get their eye checkup every year. So the ophthalmologist, not optometrist, that's somebody who gives you classes, an ophthalmologist who's a physician, that does a thorough retina examination and determines if you need like laser therapy. What they'll do if they see something like this is they'll shoot a laser at it, coagulate that so it doesn't scar up the whole rest of the retina. Okay, nephropathy. Most common cause of dead kidneys in the United States is what? Diabetes. Diabetes. Good job. And so this is horrible existence. This is a dialysis machine. This is the guy with dead kidneys. So four times or three times a week for four hours at a time, this guy's hooked up to this machine. Now, the kidneys do a lot of things. They help you uh, regulate your water concentration, your electrolyte concentration. They help filter toxins. His don't work. So he gets off the machine, um, and, and he starts gaining water weight. Toxins start building up. His electrolytes get out of whack. He starts feeling horrible. Then he goes in, gets hooked up to this machine, cleanses his blood, drains him of you know fluid. He comes out hypotensive and feeling like crap. And then he goes home and he feels starts to feel a little bit better until he starts to feel like crap again. And then he goes back to this machine. It's awful. It's awful existence. And um, that's the most common cause of kidney failure in the United States. So we want to avoid that. And we avoid that by tight sugar control. Just an illustration of the kidney to show that it has an arterial supply. Inside of those arteries have those, that cholesterol plaquing, just like in the heart illustration. It's the same, the same mechanism. Now this is a diabetic ulcer, so it's like what I talked about. Um, and, uh, and that guy, this diabetic, doesn't know that's there because he can't feel it. My mom, for example, um, I went over there the other day and, um, and she complained, hey, you know, my heel hurts a little bit. So I don't inspect her feet all the time. I pulled off her shoe and sock, and she has an ulcer this size on her heel, and cellulitis, which is a skin infection, running up to her knee. And it's like brand new, like it, this has been going on for a long time, but she couldn't feel it, so finally it got to be so deep she felt it. So I got her over to my buddy who runs the wound center for St. Vincent Hospital, and has hyperbaric chambers and stuff like that. And what he can do is he can put her into a hyperbaric chamber with not 21% oxygen, 100% oxygen, not at one atmosphere, but multiple atmospheres, and drive oxygen into the tissues to help it heal. That's one of the things that we might be able to do for these guys. So if we catch these things early, we can manage them. If we catch them late, it's like that one guy I told you about, amputation, right? And so that's why every shift on our diabetic clients, we're inspecting their feet. No, honey, I don't need you to look at it. Oh, it's fine, let me just wash them for you. Oh, that sounds nice. And you can wash your feet and you can look at that. Okay, and document that. Just kind of an illustration of the skin and what an ulcer kind of looks like. But this can get into the bone very quickly and cause osteomyelitis, which is bad, bad, bad news. So a diabetic ulcer cause, as I mentioned, peripheral vascular disease, not enough blood flow to the area, blood carries oxygen, therefore not enough oxygen in the area. Diabetic neuropathy, you can't feel the nail you just stepped on, so you don't know you have a hole in the first place. Okay, diagnosing diabetes, remember polydipsia, polyuria. What's polyuria? Excessive urination. What's polydipsia? Drinking. Right, exactly. And we don't need today in modern medicine to taste people's urine anymore. We can just get a blood glucose level or hemoglobin A1C, which kind of tells us what the, what the sugar levels are doing over a period of time. Okay, diabetes, how's it treated? It's treated in a couple ways. Diet control, first of all. If you adopt a more primitive diet, like how we evolved, then you can help delay diabetes or stop it altogether. Um, this website, you guys have a copy of all these slides. This URL is on your slides. I want you to program it into your smartphone. This guy, Dr. Stephen Gundry, is kind of the guru of paleolithic eating, paleolithic diet. And he's got a variety of recipes. And I corresponded with him and he said, I asked him, could I use my recipes for my, my, my staff? He said, absolutely, just give me credit for it. Dr. Stephen Gundry, and there you go. 
So you can go to his website and you can just kind of, okay, what am I going to make my diabetic patient for dinner? Now, all of you that have gone through orientation recently have had the module with Chef Jason. You did that, right? Mm -hmm. How was that? It was really fun. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Good. So Chef Jason teaches you things like kitchen hygiene, how to use knives, flavor palette, texture palette. Like I didn't even realize it was a flavor palette. And so you have some tools now. This is an additional tool for you to use on your smartphone. You're not allowed to use your phones when you're at work with our clients unless you're accessing data like this, okay? And for your client's purpose. And so you can go to here and you can go, okay, let me see. I want to create a dinner, American cuisine, then bake it. Okay, let's just see what we got here. Oh look, here are some recipes. Chicken and black soybean quesadilla casserole. Let's look it up. Well look at that, there's an entire recipe for you. That's a resource for you to use when you're in the field. Thank you Dr. Stephen Gundry. Okay, there are other some medications that you can use. Metformin is a really safe medication. Clipizide is something called um, sulfonylurea, which is much less safe. Um, and then it's finally insulin, which will kill you if it's given in the wrong dose. So this won't kill you, this can kill you, this will kill you. Um, and so, uh, but tight sugar control is one of the keys. So to, can I ask a question? Yeah. For someone who is diabetic and stubborn about their diet, they're not going to change their diet, they're not going to eat what you tell them to. Mm -hmm. They have their um, cupboard filled with, I don't know, Potato chips. Potato chips, white bread, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. So what say there are three main things to reduce other than saying just processed sugar like plain sure. sugar. Sugar. So what would two other things be carbohydrates to take out of yeah. their carbohydrates sugar. or reduce? Now can you also increase other things? Like if you increase fiber intake, does that help with only in, in that there's not enough room in her stomach now for the sugar. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. So, so but, which is cool. That's right. Here, drink some water before you have dinner. Uh, now okay. I, you don't like, want quite as much pie. Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, sugar, and in, and in, it's best if you have, um, you know, a client that's buying in to the, to the program. But, you know, at the end of the day, there are clients and we're going to try to give them the best advice we can. It's up to them to execute it or not. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So, um, how can we help our clients in the Sweetheart program? Well, we can make sure they're watching their blood sugar measurement, for one thing. So let me give you an example. We didn't talk about diabetic acidosis. Let's talk about it now. I had a patient um, a couple months ago who's a kid, like 23, who therefore has type 1 diabetes. His pancreas doesn't work. He hasn't been able to afford his test strip, so he can't see what his blood sugar is. He's not recording it. He's kind of giving him some, sell some insulin in the dark. And then he realized the last few days he'd been peeing a lot, drinking a lot, feeling dehydrated, and he comes in. He's in diabetic ketoacidosis. So if you don't have sugar to burn inside your cells because the key in the gas cap now isn't working because insulin isn't there, and so the gas cap's not open, so you're not letting glucose into the cell to burn, you're burning other stuff, and you're creating ketone bodies, which causes you to become acidic. The polyuria is making you uh, dehydrated and you're not keeping up with the polydipsia. So this guy comes in, uh, and normal blood sugar is up to about 100 or so, right? He came in, his blood sugar was like 800, right? And dehydrated, sick as crap. And so what we do in the ER is throw in two large bore IV, start flooding them with fluid, to manage the dehydration, start giving them insulin so that we can drop the you know, can saturate the insulin receptors on cell membranes to suck the glucose out of the bloodstream where there's too much of it into the cell where there's none of it. And the cell can start um, doing metabolism in a normal fashion. And so you do that, but this is a sick, sick, sick guy and he's going to the ICU. Uh, and so um, you probably won't see that in your clients. It's very, it's not very, it's a common, in, it's not as common in type two diabetes, which are gonna be primarily our population because they're elderly. Because of all those disease processes that I talked about, Type 1 diabetics have a tough time, and they often die early because of that. Um, but what can we do? We can make our, make, try to encourage our clients to monitor their blood sugar level and record it. And so you'll, they'll know if they're getting out of parameters, and they can see their doctor and adjust their medication, adjust their diet, whatever they need to do. Medication compliance, another big one. Mrs. Jones, it's time to take your metformin. Oh, honey, I think I took it. No, I have my record right here. You didn't take it. Let's go ahead and take it now. Let's see what your blood sugar is doing, too, at the same time. And let me check your feet as well. Awareness of related diseases and their manifestations. If someone has sudden you know, loss of sensation and motor function in one side of their body, they had a stroke. Call 911. If they have a little aching in their left hand or the lip is sweaty, 
ooh, that may be a heart attack, call Dr. Nelson. Um, so be aware of these related manifestations. Encourage them to get to their ophthalmologist once a year. Remember, really, the family that they don't have in their lives. Right? If your mom was a diabetic and you know she'd forgotten to get to the ophthalmologist to check her eyes, you'd go, Mom, it's time to go to the ophthalmologist. That's the same thing here. Oh, Mrs. Jones, when's the last time you got your retinas checked? I don't remember. Well, let's go make an appointment. Let me call up right now. Who's your ophthalmologist? Call, make an appointment. That's what we do. We substitute for family that's not there. Um, and this one's important, regular skin surveys to identify skin breakdown. So it's much more common to have these diabetic ulcers further away from your heart than closer to your heart. And so it's mostly the feet and stuff like that. So get the shoes and socks off. Even if it's icky, if it's icky in particular, you need to get the shoes and socks off, wash the skin gently, look for any ulcer formation, call me if you're concerned, look for redness, discoloration that's of a red nature that could be an infection. So those are the things that you can do. Okay, so there's a lot that we, a lot of value we can add to our clients that have diabetes. Right, this is what the Sweetheart Program is about: adding value to our clients with diabetes.